Hello and welcome to youshallpass.com This video is about uh, yield measures for floating rate instruments which is part of reading 57. Uh, we've already covered YTM and bond equivalent yields in the previous video about bond valuation. And uh, the portions of reading 57 that I've left out here, uh, I left them out because I thought they didn't represent that big a challenge for the readers. Uh, that they'll need help with them. If I thought wrong and you would like help with them, please do let me know. Okay, so before we talk about the uh, yield measures for floating rate instruments, let's talk about floating rate instruments. What are they? So far, we've met various types of bonds, but all of them had fixed coupons. As in, you knew what the coupon cash flows on the bond were going to be throughout the life of the bond. With floating rate bonds, you cannot do that. You, you cannot be sure what the coupon is going to be, say, a year or two years from now. And that's because a floating rate security is just that. Its coupon rate floats. And at best, you know what the next coupon is going to be since any time a coupon is paid, at that time, the rate for the next coupon is also set. But uh, beyond the next coupon, you don't really know. It's darkness. Alright, so I was being too dramatic. Maybe it's not that bad. Floating rate coupons, they don't just float around all over the place at random. They are, in a sense, fixed, but they are fixed in relation to some other rate, which is called the base rate. So as, the, uh, as this base rate varies, so does the coupon rate for our floating rate security. Uh, since we're aiming for an understanding of this thing from the ground up, this relationship between coupon rates and base rates probably merits a bit more explanation. Now, uh, when a floating rate bond is issued, the issuer tells you what the base rate is going to be and what the quoted margin is going to be. And the base rate plus the quoted margin then make up the coupon rate. The base rate is usually the interbank borrowing rate or the rate on treasury securities of an appropriate maturity for the country in which the, the bond is issued. So, for example, for a corporate bond issued in the US, the base rate can be that for 6-month treasury bills or the base rate can be 6-month LIBOR. And if the bonds are issued in foreign currency, that is, uh, the, the bonds are issued in a currency other than uh, the domestic currency of the, of the issuer, in that case, the base rate is almost always LIBOR. The quoted margin, which is also called the spread at issue, uh, is the basis points fixed or yield over and above the base rate that the issuer is willing to pay to compensate the investors for the various risks the investor would be assuming by investing in the bond. We uh, most recently went over the pyramid of risks in the video about bond valuation and the components of interest rates is a topic that crops up in quite a number of places in the CFA level 1 curriculum. Um, now, whatever the quoted margin is, at the point of issue, it is deemed to be adequate compensation for the various risks investors would be running by investing in the bond. And uh, once the bond is issued, the quoted margin is fixed in absolute number of basis points, and it does not change over the life of the bond. The base rate, whether it's set with reference to treasuries or LIBOR or whatever, is of course a different story. It's a market rate and hence it's subject to fluctuations on a daily, even hourly or a minute to minute basis. So it's uh, very likely that the rate will change from coupon date to coupon date. Um, so when you add a fixed quantity, which is the coupon, uh, the which is the quoted margin to a variable quantity, which is the base rate, the end result is also going to be a variable quantity. And that is the concept behind uh, calling these kinds of bonds floating rate bonds and these kind of coupons floating rate coupons. For example, assume that a bond was issued on 30th December 
and its base rate was set as LIBOR. The quoted margin at issue was 50 basis points. Now, if on 30th December the LIBOR was 1%, that means that the next coupon, due on 30th June, will be 1% plus the 50 basis of quoted margin, uh, which is 1.5%. That is the annual coupon rate. And since it's a semi-annual coupon, the coupon rate that's actually paid out will be half the annual coupon rate, half of 1.5%, that is 75 basis points. On 30th June, then if the LIBOR were to be 1.2%, then the next coupon due on 30th December will be equal to 1.7% annual coupon rate. 1.7 obviously being the base rate of 1.2% uh, on 30th June plus the quoted margin of 50 basis points. The investor again will actually receive a coupon of half of this annual rate that is 85 basis points on 30th December. On 30th December then, on the day the investor receives the the uh, the 85 basis coupon the prevailing LIBOR is say 90 basis points so you know that the next coupon that's due on 30th June is going to have an annual coupon rate of 1.4 percent and the investor is actually going to be paid uh, 70 basis points now assume that on 30th June the day the 70 basis coupon is due all hell is broken loose in the world and the LIBOR is shot up from 90 basis points to 2%. Then the next coupon, due on 30 December, will be equal to 1.25%, which is half the annual coupon rate of 2.5%, which of course is the sum of the prevailing LIBOR uh, as on 30 June, plus the quoted margin of 50 basis points. Tedious explanation, I know, and I apologize for its tediousness, but I figured, you know, academic explanation is like good food and wine. Uh, better too much than too little. The good news is that we're all done with what floating rate bonds are and how their rates float and how they are determined. So now we can get on to doing some real work. The base case, the one in blue, is that of an investor who buys a bond at issue and holds that bond throughout its life. That investor then earns the base rate, whatever it may be from coupon to coupon, and uh, spread over the base rate equal to the quoted margin. Uh, as we had mentioned earlier, the quoted margin is deemed to be adequate compensation, adequate risk premium at the time of the issuance for the risks the bond investor assumes by investing in the bond. But as time goes on, the risk characteristics of the issuer or the industry or the country in which the issuer operates can and do change. And with altered risk characteristics comes an altered risk premium. But how can the risk premium change once the bond is issued? And the answer lies in the price of the bond. Now, uh, if a bond grows less risky, due to any or a number of factors, that means that the quoted margin is more than sufficient compensation for the currently perceived risks of the bond. Therefore, the price of the bond goes up. And as the price goes up, the effective spread earned by a new investor goes down. On the flip side, if an issuer's risk profile has worsened since the bond was issued, then the quoted margin may be considered insufficient compensation or insufficient risk premium for the risks that are currently inherent in the bond. Therefore, the price of the bond goes down. And as it goes down, the effective spread that's earned by, the, by, by a new investor goes up. In both cases, the effective spread is different from the spread at issue or the quoted margin. Just how different it is, is measured by a measure called spread for life. The formula for the spread for life is as follows. And by way of example, if we have a floating rate bond which was issued with a quoted margin of uh, 50 basis points over LIBOR, and at present there are five years remaining to maturity of the bond, and for whatever reasons, the price of the bond has come down from par to $99.1 per $100 of face value. Uh, in that case then, Due to the price being below par, 
the effective spread works out to 68.62 basis points over LIBOR compared to the spread at issue or the quoted margin, which was 50 basis points. And buying the bond now is identical to buying a new bond from the same issuer uh, for the remaining maturity, which is five years, with quoted margin of 68.62 basis points over LIBOR. And uh, you should plug in some, some, you know, some more numbers into the spread for life formula to get comfortable with its usage. Uh, for example, try a bond selling at a premium. The overall idea of the spread for life is that it translates the difference in price from par into a difference in spread from the quoted margin, which obviously is much more useful for a bond trader or an analyst. The discount margin method assumes that the current base rate will persist throughout the remaining life of the bond. So in effect, it converts a floating rate bond into a fixed rate bond and assumes that uh, all future coupons will be equal to the current coupon. Once this assumption is made, the discount margin method involves computing a YTM, just as one would for a fixed coupon bond. Uh, if you recall, we went over YTMs and their computation extensively in the video about bond valuation, so we won't do it again over here. But yes, by way of definition, uh, YTM is a discount rate at which the present value of the face value and the coupons of the bond equal the full price of the bond. So um, in this case also, uh, once the YTM of this floating rate bond has been arrived at, you compare that to the current base rate. And the difference between the two is called the discount margin. And uh, needless to say, if the bond is trading at a premium, the discount margin will be less than the quoted margin. If the bond is trading at par, the, the discount margin will be equal to the quoted margin. And if the bond is trading at a discount, the quoted margin will be less than the discount margin. Alright, uh, that pretty much does it for yield measures for floating rate securities. Um, you should now be able to comfortably tackle all practice questions related to this. For more fixed income videos, please return to the main menu and have faith, practice, you shall pass.